Hey guys, Jeremiah here for another episode of Who Is It and Why Do I Care? Uh, we're going to be talking about Karen and Horn... Horn... Horn I. Uh, yeah, let's get to it. Karen Horn I was born in September 16, 1885 to Mr. and Mrs. Waggles Daniels. Her father was a sand ship's captain, he was a religious man, and he was very authoritative. His children often called him Bible thrower because, well, he uh, threw Bibles. Her mother, who is known as Sunny, was a very different person. She was his second wife, 19 years to his junior. She was considerably more urban. Karen also had an older brother who was named Bert. She cared for him a lot. She also had four older siblings from her father's first marriage. Karen Horney's childhood seems to be one of many misconceptions. For example, she says that her father was overruling and controlling. Um, but and that he preferred her brother Bert over her, but actually um, he took her on many sea voyages, which was not common for that time, and he bought her gifts from all over the world. I personally would argue that he was just trying to cover up for being a lazy father, but um, nevertheless she felt deprived of her father's affections, and because of that she cleaved to her mom, and she sought after her love, and she actually called herself her mother's lamb. She spent the first eight years of her life trying to earn recognition by being a model child. It was around the age of nine that she realized she wasn't getting the attention she wanted, so she changed her approach of life by being ambitious and rebellious. She was famously quoted, I couldn't be pretty. I decided I'd be smart. It's pretty sad because her parents were so focused on loving her brother that they just neglected loving her and encouraging her. But weirdly enough, she developed a crush on her brother. He didn't really receive it well, and she then felt rejected. And that started her feelings of depression, and those lasted the rest of her life. In early adulthood came several years of stress. In 1904, her mother divorced her father and left him with Karen and the young Bert. In 1906, Karen entered medical school against her parents' wishes, and in fact, against the opinions of polite society at the time. While she was there, she met a man named Oscar Horner, whom she married in 1909. In 1910, Karen gave birth to Bridget, the first of their three daughters. In 1911, her mother Sony actually died. The strain of these events were very hard on Karen, and she entered psychoanalysis. As Freud might have predicted, she had married a man not unlike her father. Oscar was an authoritarian, as harsh with his children as the captain had been with his. Horni notes that she did not intervene, but rather considered the atmosphere good for her children and encouraging for their dependence and independence. Only many years later did hindsight change her perspective on child raising. In 1923, Oscar's business collapsed and he developed meningitis. He became a broken man, morose and argumentative. Also in 1923, Karen's brother died at the age of 40 of a pulmonary infection. Karen became very depressed, to the point of swimming out to a sea piling during a vacation with thoughts of committing suicide. <sighs> Karen and her daughters moved out of Oscar's house in 1926, and four years later moved to the U.S., where they eventually settled in Brooklyn. In the 1930s, Brooklyn was the intellectual capital of the world due to the influx of Jewish refugees from Germany. It was here that she became friends with such intellectuals as Eric Fromm and Harry Stack Sullivan, even pausing to have an affair with the former. And it was here that she developed her theories on neurosis based on her experiences as a psychotherapist. She practiced, taught, and wrote until her death in 1952. Basic anxiety and neurotic needs. Basic anxiety is defined as the foundation for neurosis. 
Karen believed that an infant is born with a need for security, and basic anxiety can arise if security is not met. Hor and I believe that neurotic needs are developed to deal with basic anxiety, and she came up with 10 of these needs. There's the need for affection and approval, defined as the indiscriminate need to please others and be liked by them. There is the need for a partner, as defined by the need for someone who will take over one's life. This includes the idea that love will solve all of one's problems. There is the need to restrict one's life to narrow borders, as defined as being undemanding, satisfied with little, and inconspicuous. There is the need for power, defined as personal gain by exploiting other people. There is the erotic need to actually exploit other people, as defined as manipulation and needing to get the better of others. There is the need for prestige, as defined as as admiration, the need for achievements. There is the need for personal affirmation. Their fear is thought of as being nobodies, unimportant and meaningless. There is the need for personal achievement. They have to be number one at everything they do. There is the need for self-sufficiency and independence. These tend to refuse help when they need it in order to prove that they are good enough. And there is the need for perfection and unassailability. These are the people who cannot be caught making a mistake. Karen believed that neurotic disorders were not primarily the results of defects in psychosexual development and felt that they were results of de deficits in psychosocial development. All these things are in low quantities normal, but when they are compulsive or excessive is when they become neurotic. The 10 neurotic needs can be clustered into three categories, the compliant type, moving toward people, the detached type, moving away from people, and the aggressive type, moving against other people. The next concept is the tyranny of the shoulds. There's the true self versus the ideal self and the conflict that they create. The true self is all about who the person really is, like their true colors as unaffected by society. Their ideal self is very much who they want to be and who they see themselves to be in their mind. Now on to Karen's perspectives of human nature. She was definitely more free will than deterministic. She was definitely more nurturing environment than she was compared to nature. She thought people were dependent of their childhood. She focused on the past and the present, not the future. She thought people were unique as opposed to not. She was more growth-minded, and she was also very optimistic. You might be asking yourself, why does this person's ideas even matter? Well, if you're... you are in luck, because that is our final segment of today's episode. Karen Horney's theory of neurotic needs is fascinating, because all of the things that are neurotic are actually good if done in moderation. For example, it is very good to be self-sufficient, but it can go to an extreme where people offer to help you to move a piano and you refuse it as if they would look down on you because you needed help. We live in a society that tends to live in these extremes. Either we tend to be totally Captain America or only Iron Man. There are no in-betweens. Karen, however, suggests that we spend our time figuring out how to have affection and approval, but not rely on it to motivate our lives. So please, as you go on your way, make sure to do some self-analysis and identify those areas where you, yourself, are potentially a little bit neurotic. <laughs> Once you do that, try to make those tendencies towards extremes move a little bit more to the moderate side to be considerate of yourself and others. Thank you, Jeremiah out.